The following program is brought to you in living color. Hi, I'm Tony Figueroa, and welcome to another edition of This Week in TV History. Check out my blog, childoftelevision.blogspot.com. You can also hear me on TV Confidential, a radio talk show about television. And I often do the TV history segment on that show, along with my wife, Donna Allen Figueroa. And we get to do wonderful celebrity interviews and talk about all things television. So definitely check us out. Uh, today, wow, uh, I want to celebrate two milestone birthdays. I did one recently with Gavin McLeod. There are two. And I'd like to theme this, two captains turn 90. Okay, it'll make sense in a second. The first captain is probably best known as Captain Barney Miller from the show Barney Miller. How Linden was born, Harold Lipschitz. I'm not making that up. His name is Harold Lipschitz. He actually was on the road, uh, saw a town in New Jersey called Linden, saw the water tower. He became Al Linden, a uh, big band leader originally, just because uh, sing along with Harold Lipschitz did not sound right. He was born March 20th, 1931. Uh, musician, originally, he played the clarinet, saxophone. I mean, anything related to those instruments, he was versatile with all of them because uh, he learned the more instruments he was uh, capable of playing, the better his paycheck was. And so he started out as a musician, and then he later on moved into acting. He did a lot of work on Broadway, uh, did some television, commercials, uh, understudied a lot of uh, different actors and eventually was the patriarch as Meyer Rothschild in the uh, play The Rothschilds. Now, something very important happened. Uh, Danny Arnold, who would be the creator of Barney Miller, actually managed to see Hal Linden in The Rothschilds. Uh, it wasn't part of the original plan. He was going to send his kids to the theater while he was working on a project in New York. Uh, things got all screwed up on the project, so he had the free day. He decided to get another ticket, go see this show with his kids, and saw Hal Linden. He thought that the character that Hal Linden was portraying, that his, his take on the character, had this sense of Talmudic, or ta Talmudic justice. And he thought this was perfect for the character of uh, Barney Miller that he was going to play. And, you know, people consider Barney Miller the, you know, one of the best of, of cop shows. Uh, you know, it's just when you look at the history of cop shows uh, and Barney Miller falls uh, in that high category. I mean, that is very impressive. Um, Danny Arnold created Barney Miller, did a couple of pilots. Uh, Hal Linden uh, starred in, and I think, you know, he's going to be known for Barney Miller and everything else. But uh, wonderful show, wonderful ensemble, and uh, just to abbreviate everything, uh, Hal Linden has some wonderful material on YouTube. So if you want to hear him talk about his experience playing the role of Barney Miller and working with Danny Arnold, all of his co-stars in the overall production of that show. I highly recommend that you find his interviews with the Archive of American Television. Uh, he goes through so many details on the making of that show. The show was done originally before a live audience, but Danny Arnold, who started off his career as an editor, really was approaching things from that angle, and he really wanted to spend more time just getting the shots a certain way. Uh, eventually, what evolved was a show that was done multi-camera, but treated many ways like a single camera, because uh, they eliminated the live audience over a certain period of time. So the live audience was eventually removed from the equation, focusing on the content, and they were very, very long hours. But uh, how Linden said that, Danny Arnold said, we never walked away from an episode saying, oh, we'll do better next time. They were always satisfied with what was developed. Uh, Hal Linden, at the same time of Barney Miller, did two kid shows, FYI, and one I remember very well called Animals, 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 where he was uh, not only a narrator, but he also was the host. So opening segments would feature him 
talking about animals. It was a very, very fun show, a uh, very smart show. And it was very important to how to uh, have something that was not insulting to children. So you see him, you know, on, on an elephant uh, talking about uh, pachyderms and, and the, the evolution of the animal. Also, uh, they did an episode dedicated to mythological animals. Very well done show. He would later, after Barney Miller, do a show called Black's Magic, which also starred Harry Morgan, uh, where he played a musician, that, uh, not a musician, a magician who helped solve crimes with his con man father. <laughs> And uh, after that, he did a show called uh, Jack's Place, which he was a, say, a restaurateur who had a history as a jazz musician. So very talented actor, very talented musician, uh, just consummate professional. Uh, he also, I want to, before I shift to our next captain, uh, he did two TV specials for ABC during his time as Barney Miller. Uh, one of them uh, is basically him going back to New York. But before that, he did one that also featured uh, Catherine Damon, or Skipper Damon, who you might remember as Mary Campbell on Soap, uh, Bonnie Franklin, and uh, Linda Lavin. Now, all of them were doing situation comedies all at the same time. Linda Lavin was doing uh, Alice. Uh, Catherine Damon was doing Soap. Uh, Bonnie Franklin was doing One Day at a Time. But they all started in New York together, struggling. So it was kind of a special deal for him to have his closest friends from that period in his life doing this special about how they got started and how they got to where they are. And the closing number is called It's About Time. Um, but it is very autobiographical, giving his story of where he came up and working as a musician and then eventually shifting over into acting and then doing a lot of Broadway theater. So if you can find these on YouTube, I will, I will have the links below along with the archive of uh, uh, American television links. Uh, what wonderful uh, just interviews and wonderful programs. Uh, the two specials he did uh, apparently did not do well in the ratings, but they are worth watching. Uh, it is from a time period where variety was a big deal to have specials like this. Uh, was a, a huge deal. It is something that we don't see anymore, and they were both so well done. Uh, the next captain is William Shatner. I know, I'll, I'll give you a moment. Uh, best known for playing Captain James Tiberian, Ch James Tiberian Kirk on the TV series Star Trek. Or should I say Star Trek, the original series. I think uh, the character of Captain Kirk can be best described by a Klingon in Trouble with Triples as a tin swaggering dictator with delusions of godliness. I think I got that quote right. Uh, he was born March 22nd, 1931, so two days after Hal Linden. Uh, he was a trained Shakespearean actor. In fact, uh, he was an understudy for Christopher Plummer in Henry V. Now, of course, he would work again with Christopher Plummer uh, in Star Trek V. The Undiscovered Country. Remember, he played um, uh, Emperor Chang. Yeah, he had the eye patch. Yeah, it was. I know, I know this stuff. I'm just not recalling it. <laughs> anyway, uh, they got to work together. Uh, William Shatner's TV career. It's very difficult to just list it in in, in a short segment. I would say his pre Star Trek career. Um, everyone remembers his episode of The Twilight Zone. Yes, where you saw that thing on the window. Yes, that is quintessential William Shatner history right there. What you might not be aware of, he did every anthology series. He did a couple of Twilight Zones, Outer Limits, Alfred Hitchcock Presents, and Thriller. He also did an episode of Man from Uncle where he was paired with Leonard Nimoy, Mr. Spock. So they actually worked together before Star Trek. Uh, he did the second pilot of Star Trek, where no man has gone before. And that was the, the pilot that sold to Network, and they did three full seasons of that show. Uh, after Star Trek, he was, you know, working, you know, working all the time. 
uh, with different productions, did commercials, did television, did feature films. Uh, he did eventually return to the captain's chair in Star Trek The Motion Picture, which was back in 1979. And shortly around that time, uh, he did start doing T.J. Hooker. Um, I didn't know this until I was doing some research. T.J. Hooker. It's Thomas Jefferson Hooker. I thought it was one of those names that nobody really knew what it was. So it was Thomas Jefferson Hooker, uh, which also starred Adrian Zemed, uh, James Darren, who would later be part of the Star Trek franchise. Uh, he was uh, Vic the Hologram in Star Trek Deep Space Nine. Uh, Richard Hurd would later play an admiral in Star Trek Voyager, and Heather Locklear, who would uh, go on to have a career with Dynasty and Spin City and several other projects. Uh, so you had Star Trek, you had T.J. Hooker, uh, you had the Star Trek movie franchise. Um, he helped create uh, a series of books that later became a TV show called Tech War. Uh, he's credited as author, and then there were other writers who contributed. Uh, he also played a character named Denny Crane that was introduced on The Practice and then later uh, got their own, it's called a kind of a continuation or spinoff uh, called Boston Legal. Uh, Denny Crane was a, he was basically William Shatner as a lawyer. Uh, the character also was in early stages of Alzheimer's, but his character was uh, referring to his condition as Mad Cow. But uh, if you haven't seen the show, it's like, oh, this is Shatner playing himself. Uh, he also did a sitcom a few years ago called, we'll just call it Bleep My Dad Said, which was based on a, a Twitter feed that was developed into a situation comedy. It also starred uh, William Sasso. Uh, very funny show, but he can command comedy. Uh, we could talk Shatner for. Ever. But again, like Hal Linden is known for Barney Miller and everything else. William Shatner is known for Captain Kirk and everything else. Uh, but William Shatner is an American institution. Uh, he did a show uh, that started on Broadway, toured. It was over here at the Pantages Theater. It was William Shatner, uh, Shatner's world. Uh, we just live in it. Uh, still going strong. Uh, still uh, doing everything from big screen, small screen. Uh, I should mention he also had a part in uh, Miss Congeniality and Miss Congeniality 2, Sandra Bullock. Very, very talented individual and an American institution. He will tell you that he's Canadian. Uh, he also played himself in a movie with uh, Eric McCormick called The Free Enterprise, where he plays a variation of William Shatner. Uh, it is a, a a wonderful movie dealing with uh, not only him, but also fandom and people's fantasies about Star Trek. And I want to close with one other uh, element of the Shatnerverse, and that is his appearance on Saturday Night Live. Uh, he appeared uh, shortly after the release of Star Trek for The Voyage Home, one where they saved the whales. Uh, he hosted SNL, and in his monologue, he was talking about conventions, and the monologue faded into a Star Trek convention, and you have all the Trekkers uh, talking about stuff that they found uh, at different booths and what they were buying and showing off different shirts and, and uniform pieces, and the convention head introduces someone who hasn't been to a convention in a long, long time, Captain James Tiberius himself. William Shatner, and Shatner comes up and is his charming self, and then he eventually says, you know, after meeting a lot of you people and talking to you and getting to know you a little bit better, I just have to say, for God's sakes, get a life, will you, people? And it was an hysterical moment. I mean, it was one of those moments that just rocked the house. People thought it was hysterical, and he was told by Lauren Michaels afterwards, he said, oh, the geeks are going to hate you now. And he says, what do you mean? So all you did, the, you know, the whole get a life. Uh, it introduced him to uh, the convention culture. He hadn't done conventions for a long, long time. He had a bad experience at a personal appearance at a convention. Uh, he stopped going for about 10 years. Uh, it inspired him to go undercover in costume cosplay 
and actually explore the convention without having people know who he was. And he wrote a book about it called Get a Life. Uh, when I first started blogging, Child of Television blog, I originally had an element called the Shatner Award, where I would give awards to people who needed to get a life because it's just the TV show. People who took something they saw on TV, blew it out of proportion. I tended to give the award uh, to people who like to blame the media. Uh, we would have a, a meeting of the committee at the Don Knotts Room at the Burbank Hilton and decide who the recipient of that award was. So uh, I eventually phased that out of the blog, uh, but uh, him having that moment uh, made a connection to fans or made a connection to fans. But uh, his contribution to American pop culture is, is parallel. Nothing, nothing really compares. And as I'm talking Star Trek, I realize I'm wearing a red shirt, which means that this can't end well. So before anything else happens, uh, please comment below, uh, like, subscribe, or subscribe and like. The, you know where they are. Uh, you have other ideas for segments I could talk about with TV history, please let me know. Uh, listen to me on TV Confidential, a radio talk show on television. Check out my blog. And again, I'm Tony Figueroa. Stay tuned. I'll do it this way this time.